Hello, and welcome to API Conversations. I'm Marsha Barnhart, Chief of Investigations for the Aerial Phenomenon Investigations Team, and your host for this episode. My guest today is Dr. Mark Rodiger. Dr. Rodiger is President and Scientific Director of the J. Allen Hynek Center for UFO Studies. The center was founded originally by Dr. J. Allen Hynek, who was a professor of astronomy at The Ohio State University, and later chairman of the astronomy department at Northwestern University near Chicago, where the Center for UFO Studies is based. The center is a privately funded UFO research group. Dr. Rodiger, who holds a B.S. in astrophysics from Indiana University and an M.A. and Ph.D. in sociology from the University of Illinois at Chicago, has headed the center since 1986. He was a colleague of Dr. Hynek's and shares the same passion for approaching the UFO-UAP phenomenon from a scientific point of view. His work at the Center for UFO Studies dovetails perfectly into his work as science director with the UFO Data Project, which is the subject of this episode of API Conversations. I spoke with Dr. Rodiger and recorded the following conversation with him on June 12, 2017. People have been thinking about studying um, UFOs directly uh, with instrumentation for uh, many years, um, back into the 19, well, really, actually the 1950s, you know, just soon after UFOs were, you know, the modern era. Um, and um, various, you know, amateurs and some scientists, like Dr. Harley Rutledge in Missouri, um, have done some work over the years. You know, going out in the field and actually, uh, you know, seeing something anomalous and then either taking a picture or getting maybe a magnetic recording of, uh, you know, what magnetic field at the time. And um, and in some uh, unique cases, getting a, uh, a spectrum of an object uh, that was seen. Uh, but it was never uh, systematized. And with one exception, at Hestalen in Norway, um, we have not had... Uh, the capability to put instrumentation out in the field on a long-term basis and to put, uh, you know, more than one station uh, in various locations and to systematically collect uh, data about UFOs. Um, and uh, but, but everybody has known, those who have paid attention to, to the subject, we've known that this was uh, really a requirement uh, to, to try to make progress. You can't rely on witness reports as your sole source and your only source of information. Mm -hmm. So um, we, uh, you know, what happened is it then two things uh, that immediately uh, triggered um, the UFO data project, you know, becoming reality. Uh, one is the advance in electronics and computing and the Internet uh, that has made the uh, a station that can, uh, you know, operate on its own and do the things I described has made it much, much more feasible than it used to be. Um, and then secondly is crowdfunding. Um, there it has been very little money, uh, as probably many of your listeners know, for doing UFO investigations or research. And um, the Kickstarter and Indiegogo and a few other such sources also arose, you know, fairly recently in the last 10 years or so. And um, they have uh, funded thousands of projects, including science projects. And so when Alex Went and I were discussing uh, this, when he was still in Chicago, so we would meet at the center and, and talk about things, um, you know, we put these two features together about uh, how things had changed and said, you know what, now it's, now it's possible to do this. So why not us? Let's do it. Okay. How did you... Uh... 
cast around for some uh, compatriots to join you on this. You wanted experts, clearly. So then how did you reach out and pull your team together? Fortunately, I'm pretty well connected in the UFO field. You know, Alex is, is, is less so, of course. Uh, he hasn't been in, uh, looking into and, and thinking about UFOs quite as long. So I knew, uh, either knew very closely or, or, or knew somewhat, you know, many of the people who are technically inclined and have done field work, like Dave Akers uh, or Erling Strand at Hestow and, and, and so forth. Um, so after we decided to do this, and of course we still, we talked about it among you know, the two of us for quite some time to get some ideas about how to proceed, um, you know, we just began to reach out uh, directly to these people and uh, uh, and introduce ourselves if we didn't know them directly, like uh, I knew about Massimo Teodorani, the Italian uh, physicist, but I had not talked to him or, or met him in person or corresponded with him. And, but we introduced the idea, and it didn't take much prompting or, or encouragement uh, to get people involved. In fact, we, we had a very high success rate um, at, at, at people saying, yes, I'd like to be at least lend my name to the project. Uh, because as I've said, I don't think, I don't attribute that necessarily to how wonderful Alex and I are, but I think it's simply the idea um, and the concept and the, uh, the, the project uh, is naturally one that's appealing. And if it appears that somebody is serious about it, then, you know, other people who uh, are serious are going to sign on. Right. Yes. This at at this point in technology, as you were saying, this is scalable. So uh, this is doable at this point. Now, can you go into some depth as to who is involved, the major players, what their positions are, and what contribution they'll bring to the project? The the third person uh, who is uh, was, was in at the beginning, uh, not right at the beginning, but shortly after that, is a guy named Philip Aralis, who is at uh, uh, one of the European Space Agency organizations and has a uh, um, his own website and had been blogging about UFOs and thinking about UFOs and had contacted me already at the center um, before the UFO data project got going and, and we'd exchanged ideas and um, he lives in uh, the Netherlands. Um, and uh, I knew he was interested in this kind of field work and so we invited him to be a member of our board. And so he said, uh, you know, yes, absolutely to that. Um, and then uh, we added Leslie Kane, uh, the well-known uh, journalist and author of, uh, of a UFO book, uh, to be on the board as well. Um, and then so, and then we rounded it out with a, a fellow named Chris Mellon, who is part of the uh, Mellon family uh, of um, you know of, of some uh, renown in terms of uh, investment and so forth. The Carnegie Mellon Group. That's right. Mm-hmm. Um, but as far as the science technical side goes, um, we I mentioned a, a couple of the fellows already. Erling Strand mm-hmm. uh, is an engineer in Norway, and he has, for over 30 years, has led the investigation at Hestown in Norway, which has been the most successful um, effort at measuring anomalous phenomena out in the field. Uh-huh. Um, and Massimo Teodorani is, is, I think, the leading physicist today who uh, thinks about and studies UFOs, and he's also been to Hestal, and he's been all around the world trying to make field measurements of UFOs, not with stations that he constructs. He brings equipment with him and then does it there in the field with, with, with other local investigators. Mm-hmm. But he's also written theoretical papers. He's interested in SETI uh, studies as well, kind of unusual approaches to SETI. So he's a kind of a Renaissance fellow, and he also, he also actually you know, writes his own music and performs it. Um, so he, he's a member of the team. Uh, Eamon Ansbro is uh, a astronomer in Ireland, Northern Ireland, who uh, has his own observatory. Also, uh, at the observatory, has had cameras set up and uh, other equipment to potentially capture uh, UFO sightings, and has been doing this for uh, you know many years. Um, Ron Masters is a uh, PhD chemist. Uh, and uh, uh, he is has uh, designed a novel uh, type of uh, spectrograph uh, system um, uh, based on the shell, uh, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, concept. And, um, uh, and he, so he's part of our kind of our photographic portion of the team. 
And Dave Akers uh, really is uh, maybe the core member of our technical team in, 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 on the engineering side because Dave also, like uh, Erling Strand, has been involved even longer, though, since the early 1970s at studying UFOs in the field. And he's the guy who went to Yakima in Washington at the Indian Reservation area and uh, did field studies way back then uh, of um, strange balls of light that had been reported by both members of the the Indian uh, tribes and also members of the public mm-hmm. uh, and forest ranger lookouts and all that. And he's been working on and off on field studies, you know, ever since. Keeps a very low profile. Um, and then we, we have uh, a few other people as well. Hawken Kale, who's, uh, who's a, uh, a physicist at a, a European university and, uh, and so forth. So it, it's, it's well-rounded, uh, you know, small core team of people, um, who have varying expertise, uh, you know, we, we need to add to it as we're trying to do with additional volunteers. Uh, but uh, as I said, it wasn't hard to recruit them. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now, so you have this this cast of characters that you stay in contact with because they're far flung. I mean, they're worldwide. So you stay in contact with them with various means of communication. And then you together have decided how you kind of want this platform to be and how you plan to deploy it and then garner science from it. So um, when we talk about that aspect of this project, uh, can you say... When you're going to deploy, I understand that you're going to start with just a uh, a working model in one site. Is is that true? Right. So, uh, the, this project is not rocket science, and it, it's it's uh, you know <laughs> it's a trite phrase, but it, but it's a correct phrase mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. while nobody has quite done in the UFO field uh, what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, in other areas of science, uh, people have certainly built automated stations to do things. Right. Um, the, on the other hand, uh, this isn't a trivial project uh, because it involves a, a fair amount of instrumentation eventually, uh, Internet connections, um, you know, security issues, of course, um, and software uh, because we have to have a camera system that will not uh, turn on, uh, as it were, uh-huh. uh, for every little blip that goes by in the sky. We have to have a detection algorithm uh, that will weed out things that are uninteresting. Um, so you have to build something like this in stages. And so, yes, as you say, uh, the first unit will not have every in- instrument possible on it, and it will be, you know, tested actually literally probably in somebody's backyard. So there will be uh, one of our, you know, engineering folks will be there to work with it regularly, um, and it will get its shakedown crews uh, in all aspects and all systems, uh, you know, a, a, in that sense. And then you move on from there. You know, so if you have a working, uh, simple prototype that works well, you know, right where somebody's, you know, nearby to, to look at it if necessary, 24 hours a day. Then the next step is probably don't add anything to it. Now you move it out somewhere more remote, and you run it there. And how far it can run on its own, and you know you do all those kinds of tests. And and meanwhile you tweak the software and so forth. Uh, and and then uh, at that point, I mean I don't want to presume too much because who knows what we'll discover. But at that point, uh, if things are going well, then actually what I probably want to see is that you then deploy. <clears throat> the first station, even if, even with its limited instrumentation, into the uh, quote-unquote real world, uh, and try to start capturing data if you get lucky enough to find a UFO that comes within range. But you also then start to work on version 2.0 of this station, um, where uh, you then build on the successful work and you be, you add instrumentation to it, and you know whatever other capabilities are necessary. Um, and then you go about, you know, you test that forward. So it, it's definitely going to be uh, a step-by-step process because it's not simple enough to build in one giant leap. Right, right. So you have some proprietary um, equipment. That chemist built something that hadn't existed really before, huh? Or certainly existed for this application? There's nothing proprietary, but, but as much as possible, um, we, we buy stuff and integrate it rather than building it ourselves. 
we are going to buy as much as possible off-the-shelf equipment. Here's what we need to build a station, you know, just at a high level. Right. Um, you have to you have to decide first of all, and after you just uh, think about, it, eventually we're going to have this much instrumentation, and we're going to have need this much computing power, and um, you know, a, a power supply, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, it needs to be this big, and so it's going to be in this kind of enclosure. It's obviously most, not most, but part of it has to be enclosed for operational purposes, even though the instruments naturally have to be exposed to the atmosphere so they can do their thing. Okay, then, so you need to design of the enclosure space and so forth and, and all that. The actual instrumentation, magnetometer, uh, microwave detection, high-frequency radio waves, cameras, we're not going to build those. Those we're going to purchase because you, you don't want to build devices like that yourself, and there are sources where you can buy those. But uh, in terms of the computing power, same thing, we're not going to build our own computer. We're going to either use a, a full-fledged PC, or well, we're going to use a, a, these things that are called Raspberry Pi boards or the equivalents, which are basically a very, very stripped-down computer. It's like a motherboard of a computer with processors, but without everything else hanging on it. Um, and so we're going to use those. Um, but the part that is, it, there's nothing proprietary, but the part that then becomes, okay, well, where, where, where does the work go in besides selecting all this is naturally linking it all together, getting the software to make it operate together, getting the right software to do the, um, the um, uh, uh, you know, ID, the detection of things, the motion detection to decide, okay, we now should uh, turn on the full-fledged cameras and the higher resolution cameras and record this and so forth. And so the software challenge uh, is going to be one where it's very likely that we will have to uh, possibly take existing uh, open source software and, and modify it, but I'm sure we will, um, to do that. Um, so uh, that that's, um, um, I, I you know, my, my 10,000 foot view mm -hmm. of uh, what has to go into this, but but as much as possible, um, we, we buy stuff and integrate it rather than building it ourselves. Yeah, off the shelf stuff with some of the stuff that you would have to um that you would have to modify. Now now take for example, you know, the object recognition software that that will discern the mundane from the anomalous is that existing would you have to tweak that would you have to tell this existing software to you know these are when satellites are coming over this area so disregard these dates and times or how is that going to work have you gotten into the object recognition software end of it uh to deploy yet we haven't done as much work on the software side as I, as you know, I, I thought we would by this point. So I don't have an answer on that uh, uh, on your question there about like you know which uh, software package might we use or which open source module or what have you. But I do know that even though there are a couple of programs out there uh, that are used by people, there's even one called UFO or UFO detection or something from a guy in Japan uh -huh. that is mostly used by people who look at meteors because, of course, there is a whole network of cameras out there that try to det and do detect uh, uh, meteorites in the uh, uh, meteors of, uh, and to hit the ground. They're meteorites, but when they're up there, they're meteors, and um, they detect them and, and take photos and also then um, uh, weed out uh, planes and you know other other stuff, insects that are not interesting. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, our challenge is possibly even more severe. First of all, we're, we're, we obviously don't want to worry about meteors, but you, we're looking at things often that can, can hover in place. Um, UFOs are, are reported to do that, uh, or at least for part of the sighting, and then maybe move uh, more quickly. And so um, that means if something's hovering, but bright or interesting, we might want to then record it, even though you know it's not it's not quote unquote motion detection, right? Because it's not moving. Right. Um, so that's that's this is going to be because I said a big challenge on the software side um, to not record everything and then have too much data to weed through to find those few nuggets. Because what we all know is that even if we're fortunate enough to uh, have some um, uh, UFO phenomena occur uh, near enough to a station uh, for us to get data, 
it's not going to happen very often. You know, it has Stalin, where they've had cameras running uh, 24 hours a day for a long time. You know, they get sightings, but they're infrequent. Um, and has sounds a place where we know sightings occur regularly, what, you know, whatever they are. Um, and there are some places around the world where that's true, too. Um, but, uh, again, there is nowhere where UFO sightings occur regularly and frequently, because if there were, we'd already be there <laughs> waiting. <laughs> you know, we already would have gone there and been looking. Yeah. So, uh, I, yeah, so that, that, that's the other big challenge. Is, uh, and, and to be honest, maybe the biggest challenge it isn't technology. It is basically trying to get in the right spot, running this project long enough, and getting a little lucky to have a you know a UFO sighting occur or a UFO phenomenon occur nearby. Yeah, yeah. It'd be a shame to have to hold everything up until you got this software that would accurately uh, hone in on the specific thing you wanted, but just start the whole program and just let it capture whatever it uh, whatever excites uh, the the equipment to start recording as it is now. Like you know, I have a trail cam. I go out and check every couple of days just to see what's wandered by, and I find some pretty interesting critters. And so it, it would be a shame to hold off on this entire higher deployment until you finally got this software that would trigger an event that was just the specific event you were interested in. And even that software might not even det- detect uh, something that happened to be anomalous that, you know, a glitch or whatever. So just kind of a shotgun shot of the sky would be helpful if you had someone around there who could could go to that station and check it off. And so that's another thing where you're going to deploy if it's somebody who can go out there and and have hands on that equipment all the time or if it's out where you have to you know take a day trip right what's how's your thinking on that where we're going to deploy we haven't picked the of course spots we have had people by the way volunteer already and say you know i live in a nice spot that's isolated with dark skies and um uh you know and you could put it on my property and so forth so we, we 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 have a few who have come forward in that sense and uh so that's good uh, and, and we know there'll be more. Uh, but as far as the general characteristics of deployment, uh, you're absolutely correct uh, that uh, you, you can't actually put a station literally in the middle of nowhere, because if something goes wrong, then yes, you can't go there to service it. Um, and it is true that uh, scientists put uh, automated stations in the ocean, you know, buoys that uh, measure wave size and water temperature and so forth, but they're um, they're, they measure a few things. They're very rugged. Uh, they still fail uh, now and then. But, uh, you know, nevertheless, they, and they also typically have a fair amount of funding behind those projects. Um, uh, as a relevant aside, uh, there's a project going on now uh, here in Chicago at, uh, run jointly by uh, Argonne Labs and the University of Chicago called the Array of Things, uh, the Array of Things, funded uh, to the tune of, I think, $3 million by the National Science Foundation, uh, and it is going to deploy small little stations, um, uh, we'll call them, on uh, the tops mostly of streetlights in Chicago, and it's going to measure environmental factors like air pollution and other things, and have a a camera, too, that that takes photos, just still photos uh, now and then, to begin to measure uh, uh, more accurately things about the environment, and this project is going to be extended uh, across the world, uh, you know, not just here in Chicago, um, as a way to better understand our environment. Mm -hmm. Um, So these people are facing the same types of uh, challenges, uh, but their stations are not going to be in remote areas. This is designed to be an urban project where you're putting aside the fact you have to actually get up on top of a street pole. Uh, you know, there's going to be somebody around uh, locally who can who can handle a problem that comes up. And there's going to be so many of these that having one of them fail is not a big deal because they may have, you know, 200 in a big city or something. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So getting back to, you, to your point or your question, um, we won't put a station of ours, in, let's say, in a big city because we know that not only – our UFO is not seen as regularly in big cities, but more importantly, there's too many other things going on to, that would confuse our motion detection or our, our ID software. Um, and so places like urbanized areas are not good for 
a project like ours. But neither are areas, as I said, in the middle of nowhere, the, you know, the the, uh, the Death Valley in California, uh-huh. way too isolated, way too far from people, you know. And, and, and so what, what you want to do with this is find an area that is relatively isolated, you know, dark skies and far away from urban areas, but still with people around. Uh, in particular, close enough to somebody who we've either deputized to work with us or uh, closer to one of the you know, project members, so that if something does come up, uh, that yes, they can go there and, and fix or, in the worst case scenario, bring the station back to you know some spot for servicing because the stations are going to be portable. They'll be large, but not so large you couldn't put it in the back of a pickup truck and you know bring it back. Uh-huh. Um, so that's why that so that that's the thinking right now about you know, the general guidelines for uh, placement. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now, my next question: I'd like to drill down into the equipment and how it will gather the science that you need. Um, so let's talk a bit about your optics and about the spectroscopy that you'll apply in your science here. Um, well, we uh, um, expect to be, it's basically um, all the standard kind of characteristics of, uh, imagine you have a light, uh, you know, which could be ball lightning, another thing that most people have heard of now. Mm-hmm. So imagine that we're still trying to figure out the, the exact characteristics of ball lightning, and scientists know it exists. There are literally dozens of theories about it, but no one theory that people have agreed on. Um, so, okay, so here's the ball lightning, you know, a, a half a mile away. What do we want to measure about it? Well, there's a lot of things we want to measure, and those turn out to be exactly the same as what we want to measure about UFOs. We want to measure its magnetic field. We want to actually measure the, the, the temperature around us and the atmospheric pressure and the humidity, just in case those are important. We might want to measure any sound waves that come off this, even at very, very low frequency. Mm-hmm. Um, we certainly want to take a picture, and yes, we want to get a, a, a with a spectrograph so that we get a spectrum or spectrums. We want to get more than one, hopefully, of the uh, uh, spectra of the object, uh, so that uh, we can, of course, find out, you know, what it's composed of. And uh, you can learn, of course, a tremendous amount from a, a spectrum of an object. And so, uh, as we do with the stars and our sun and other things up in the sky. Uh, and so that's really the the key measurement is, is that. But we also want to measure various types of other information that's in the uh, the full spectrum, like microwaves, radio waves, um, you know, all those kinds of things. Probably not. We don't think that uh, these things are emitting gamma rays or X rays. Those are not easy to. I mean, you can measure that, but but it, it's a little more expensive to get the instrumentation for that, and also. Uh, UFOs, if they're emitting this, uh, aren't emitting it at such a uh, um, intensity that it would probably be easy to detect. Um, and one reason we think that is because you know people don't get close to UFOs and then die later from uh, exposure to X-rays or gamma rays. Mm-hmm. Uh, there have been a few cases of people being you know, reporting injuries from uh, UFOs, but they're thankfully uh, very very rare. Um, and so uh, that that area of the Electromagnetic spectrum is not one that we would concentrate on. In other words, high uh, intensity radiation down there. Uh, at the, again, that range. Yeah. Um, you know, we're also not going to be looking for neutrinos. I mean, I'm just casting far afield to say, well, we could look for, you know, particles being emitted by by this. Uh, but we're not. That, that of course requires detectors that are, you know, well well beyond any reasonable capability. Uh, even though, of course. Is you know could these things be emitting in excess of some particle? Uh, again, not too much, uh, you know, of high energy like cosmic rays, but you know something else that uh, you know passes right through everything like neutrinos. And the answer is well, you know, I guess they could be, but we uh, but but basically you can't detect that so uh, in, in an easy way. So we're not even going to conceive of it. But basically, you know, to, in summary, we want to measure. Uh, everything that is um, reasonable and feasible, uh, and uh, and also cost uh, not an arm and a leg to measure about this. 
because we don't know what piece of data might uh, give us a clue mm -hmm. um, and, and, and reveal more about the, uh, the nature phenomena. So we, we, do, we would like to measure uh, as much as possible. Well, you know, I, you're familiar, of course, with uh, Richard Haynes and NARCAP, and I know that they've done a lot of work and gathered data to um, to try to determine what about the phenomena sometimes causes uh, electrical equipment to malfunction and radar to go offline and that type of thing. Now, so you have the ability to detect if this is throwing out any type of uh, radiation or... Uh, power that would affect the environment around it. Now, when it comes to to light, if if a orb were flying about, you know, and let's let's you can detect with this from a plasma or metal, not a picture, but you have equipment that would detect if this were a plasma ball, a gaseous type of thing, or a metallic uh, kind of object. Would your equipment do that? Um, you know the. the if it's if it's gaseous uh, or a plasma, a spectrum will help you determine that. Uh -huh. uh, if something was metallic and was reflecting the light of the sun, let's say a sighting was during the day, yeah, then the reflected light would uh, you wouldn't tell you it was metallic, but if if we uh, took a photo and got a spectrum, and the spectrum was of the sunlight, basically, uh, attenuated and affected by the atmosphere, uh -huh. um, then we would say, okay, well, whatever it is, it's, it's, you know, it's reflecting sunlight. You know, th th there's a solid object there or something solid enough to be reflecting sunlight. You know, you know would that prove it's metallic? It wouldn't prove it's metallic, but it would certainly show that there was something solid there. Uh-huh. So you know, again, you, you know, the, that's why the spectrum spectral capabilities are really the uh, what we think could be the key. Like I, I, we don't want to assume too much, though. You know, it's possible that we might uh, we were going to measure uh, very high frequency, uh, you know, uh, radio waves and uh, low frequency receiving receivers as well. We're going to measure all that part of the spectrum. That is, you know, above the our the end of the light, you know, the red end of the spectrum, and above microwaves. And if we can measure that, you know, maybe something will show up there that, um, you know, in, in you know beyond the infrared that we say, oh, look at that, you know, uh, it, it, this particular bit of radiation, you know, at, at at this frequency and this intensity, oh, this indicates such and such, right? I, you know, who knows what that would be. So we don't presume anything except to say that, you know, right, that, uh, that you know, we're, we're just looking to measure everything and then see what we see. Yeah, you can determine if, if something is emitting a light or emitting an energy and if something is reflecting a light. That could be discerned with your equipment. Right, right. I mean, one of the, the thing about um, the UFO phenomena is that um, um, if, if it is a natural phenomena, a strange but natural phenomena, uh, uh, then we should be able to um, learn a lot about it and make uh, a significant amount of progress with the stations that I'm uh, describing. If it's a if it is an, a uh, a manufactured phenomena, at least some of it, right, by aliens or whatever, mm -hmm. we will we will learn different things. But we will also be able to rule out things like you know, we we just talked about you know if something's a plasma, and how do you determine that? And um, and you know you can determine that, uh, and we would be able to determine that. And so uh, it, so we would you know be able to say, well, we took a photo, and this thing looks like it's an object, and in fact, you know the the spectrum that we got, you know, shows that it, it's not a plasma or a gas, and so forth. So we could begin to rule things out. What, what I'm getting at now is that, um, and this is true also with UFO sightings in general, you can't prove that something is alien technology. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's, of course, the thing that, that interests all of us is, gee, could there be, you know, aliens visiting Earth and our UFO sightings a manifestation of that? Mm -hmm. And um, so that is such a, a, a tantalizing but, but also 
such an extreme hypothesis, extreme being naturally one that you know goes well beyond the boundaries of conventional science, yeah. that the only way to definitively uh, demonstrate it and to and to say that well there there's really some you know potential of validity here you know that this could be true is to get evidence that is almost incontrovertible. What would that be? That would be a piece of a UFO which which had isotope ratios that didn't match those on Earth or in the solar system. Yeah. Um, or things like that. Or a manufactured device that that its isotope ratios were um, the same as here, but its characteristics and what it could what it did didn't match anything manufactured on Earth. Um, things like that scream alien technology. Yeah. Measurements of things that are, you know, uh, distant but nearby, uh, you know, within the vicinity of a scientific measuring instrument can say to you, well, this is really interesting, and it's, and it's not this, and it's not this, and it's not this, mm -hmm. and look at these characteristics. But leaping from there to, you know, aliens um, is not going to be easy, uh, but that's, that's, you know, this is science, and what we're trying to do is science by you know, measuring this this uh, phenomena that's been around now for so long. Yeah. Well, science has a long ways to go, obviously. I mean, uh, a lot of UFOs uh, reported, uh, cases I've taken, too, are um, seemingly plasma-type balls that appear to be under some type of intelligent control. Now, what we don't know about the fourth state of matter can fill science books. And so here we have a case of where it seems that plasma balls are um, zipping about our environment seemingly under control, but because we don't know much about plasma yet, we don't know but what these are plasma balls that are being, you know... Um, kind of moved about by forces, magnetic forces that are running underground or something. So there's much to learn, even if we find an odd phenomenon, it could still be um, something that is is terrestrial, earthly, and just a new understanding of plasma, huh? Absolutely. The uh, uh, Right. I, I know that, you know, you, you're uh, referring to the fact that, that uh, observers have, right, reported... Um, uh, glowing balls of light that don't act like they're natural because, yes, they they seem to have a mind of their own or they even seem to interact with the observer. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I've, I've even talked to, of course, some of the people uh, who have you know, had that experience, mm -hmm. and I, I know that it was real to them, and I, I have no reason to doubt their report. Um, and so... Uh, that's part of the, you know, the broad-based UFO phenomena. And so, sure, if, you know, we're not uh, definitely uh, you know, hewing to only one hypothesis about UFOs. In fact, we don't have any in the UFO data project. We don't have a hypothesis except that uh -huh. UFOs are unexplained and worth investigating. And, we, you know, we need to measure all this data about them. And then, uh, you know, let's see what that tells us hmm. about you know what it might be, but but certainly, if we uh, if our first sighting happens to be something like a glowing ball of gas, or you know appears to be gas that you know floats around and flits around like the the Marfa lights uh, that have been reported in Texas uh -huh. for all these years, which yeah. I think are you know the the good sightings there are mysterious as well, mm -hmm. uh, but but don't necessarily point toward you know aliens or something. Um, yeah, we're still interested in that, and uh, you know, hopefully, we will be able to find things there that will, you know, lend a more insight into what might be uh, the, you know, the, the physical causes or the physical mechanisms rather that generate those those weird balls of light that people have reported for thousands of years. Yeah, those those balls of lights might be uh, best. Uh investigated by a geologist on the team, I suppose. Right, right. Um, we, you know, we don't yet have a a, um, a geologist on the team as such, but I don't think we'd have a problem finding some if we got interesting data. Yeah. Now, 
you uh, you've been at the Center for UFO Studies for a long time, and I can see where this UFO data project certainly meshes with that. And you've been studying UFO reports for a long time, and your boss before you for a long time, J. Allen Hynek. So we already know some things about what we colloquially call UFOs. What do we know uh, most of what we know about UFOs uh, is about the patterns in the sightings. Um, you know, w- you know, putting aside the, the kind of uh, very um, uh, simple yet important generalizations that you know there are unexplained sightings and uh, you know these types and and so forth. Um, you know, what we know about the phenomena um, are things like you know what time of day it occurs. Uh, you know, what season of the year it occurs, what the uh, shapes are of sightings and how those have changed over time, uh-huh. uh, and other characteristics have changed over time, uh, you know, like close encounters have diminished in, in uh, frequency, um, you know, how, uh, how abduction reports have increased, in, you know, on the other hand, over time. Uh, we know that um, uh, sightings occur broadly and just about anywhere where you ask people, um, you will find UFO reports. So UFO reports don't seem to be confined to one location or to the U.S. and Western Europe. You know, once uh, China was opened up to the West, we know about UFO reports there, and the, the same is true with many Asian countries. And so we think that, uh, for example, the uh, that yes, two things: UFO reports occur everywhere. And if we don't have data on that, it's strictly because of a language barrier Mm -hmm. or a cultural barrier at reporting them Mm -hmm. um, or a a, um, reticence among the local media or others to write about the subject. Uh, And then finally, maybe a lack of of people willing to go out and do investigations, again, often for cultural reasons and social reasons. So, uh, but every time... There is um, uh, if someone placed in, in, a, in, a, in a location who can, um, uh, you know, confidentially um, get UFO reports, you know, that, because they know the, the witnesses, they know the people, uh, then, you know, we find reports mm-hmm. uh, from everywhere. So there's no reason. To, so, so that's an important thing, actually. You know, UFOs are ubiquitous. They are everywhere. They um, they also, of course, another thing we know is they were seen before 1947. Yeah. Um, there are. It's true that there aren't lots of reports that were made before then. There are certainly. I'm not thinking of the airship wave and all that. I'm just thinking of good old standard UFO reports. Because there was no place to report them at the time, they those reports came up, you know, to our um, attention years later. Mm-hmm. So, for example, in the 1950s. Donald Kehoe and other people began to re- get letters from people who said, oh, you know, I, I read your book, and 20 years ago when I was on the farm in Missouri, this happened. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so they would be talking about something that happened in 1934 in Missouri that was, if they reported it today, we'd say, yeah, that's a standard UFO sighting they had. Yeah. Uh, but they just kept it to themselves. Didn't, maybe they didn't even tell their neighbors, because what, what would there be to say? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so, so those those are the kinds of things we know about UFOs, um, and those don't give us um, any penetrating insight uh, into, uh, you know, to lift the veil on the phenomena and look and say, okay, well, that that naturally then means that they such and such and such and such. Uh, but it does, um, you know, tell us that we that, that at least we can describe the phenomena, which is in, in the first step, by the way, in science. Mm-hmm. Um, after you sharpen your pencils and get your notebook ready, um, is to um, begin to describe whatever it is you're studying. You know, you, until you describe and have data about it, you can't theorize mm-hmm. um, and or come up with hypotheses. Um, and so that's what we're, we've done in, in uh, uh, the UFO study uh, all these years. You know, of course, they, you had to go out and, and investigate individual cases yeah. and do all that work. And I've left out field studies and, you know, a few studies of actual 
the material and uh, you know it's ground traces but but as far as the uh describing the data that's you know some of the summaries i made here about time of day and so forth and where they're seen or whether or not you know seen in shapes and things that so that's all pretty well pinned down i mean i'm, I'm very confident when when people say you know, tell me about the UFO phenomena. I can report these things and say, yeah, it's pretty accurate. You know, this is the way it is. But there are various characteristics that have been described by um, people who have had first-hand encounters, and those characteristics have fallen into categories, too. Can you talk about that? Yes. Like, like people who... Yeah. People see things just disappear or go so quickly it just leaves a blur. Can you denote some of the characteristics of the phenomena that have been um, described by people that you've you've done studies on? Well, the, uh, the one of the, the if we delve deeper, like the second level about the UFO phenomena, you know, one area is you know how UFOs are reported to move, um, and this is interesting uh, because. Uh, there are reports where, um, first, uh, people will say, you know, the UFO flew away very, 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 very quickly. I, I can't you know, underline very or say it too many times. Literally, it was close by, and I saw it go away. I watched it go away, and in two seconds, it went out of sight. Well, I could see it for two seconds going out of sight, meaning, you know, you can calculate that, and you come up with, you know, 6,000 miles an hour or some crazy 8,000 miles an hour, some amazing figure. Uh -huh. And if the report is accurate, well, you know that's nothing terrestrial. It doesn't mean it's not some weird natural phenomena, but it tells you something about the phenomena. Right. Uh, and UFOs in the old days were reported to, you know, come to, down to the ground in a falling leaf motion. Um, and so... There are things like that about their, you know, the way the way that they, you know, again, uh, you know, move through the sky or hover and so forth. You know, then if you take uh, completely at the other end of the uh, spectrum are the uh, the uh, entities associated with UFOs, because the close encounters of the third kind, mm -hmm. the term coined by my mentor Alan Hynek, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, definitely uh, describes something that thousands of people have reported. Um, you know, then, then they became abduction cases, which people then call close encounters of the fourth kind, but the, uh, where you're, you know, you're abducted by, uh, aliens. But if you, all you do is see them or maybe, you know, talk to aliens or what have you, then it's just a C3. And there, um, the, yeah, there are patterns though. They, uh, the, uh, patterns are not quite as distinct. Uh, people have reported a variety, uh, of entities, small, large, uh, attractive, ugly, um, you know, a range of behaviors, uh, you know, the, the, they don't report every possible thing. You know, they don't, for example, give us souvenirs to take back with us usually. Right. Um, and, but, but they do, you know, they, they talk, and they, it's usually through telepathy, that is a pattern. Very rarely do they actually converse verbally yeah. uh, with a witness. Um, and so... Uh, but but the, but the idea that uh, that gee if these things are flying around their alien spacecraft you know would there be something inside them and uh, you know the answer is well as as witnesses report yes that's uh, possible sometimes they've even reported uh, what you might think are, are robots or you know manufactured devices yeah kind of an artificial intelligence type of being well you know I've read a lot of reports and and recently there's been um, reports of where an object will be dropping other little objects or some type of fluid or something like that, and that's kind of come on the radar, so to speak. And speaking of radar, you know, there are radar paints of this and radar data that tells us how fast a particular thing transited a portion of the airway. And um, just recently there was a video with infrared, forward-looking infrared, that that case from, I guess it was Puerto Rico, that was rather instructive, wasn't it? Yes, absolutely. The, the Puerto Rican case with the, related to the, uh, I can't think of the exact, the Air Transport Authority or what have you, but uh, it was a government-related uh, plane that was flying. Yeah. Uh, and the report is extensive, and, and one of the, actually one of the guys uh, spearheading that, Robert Powell, is on our UFO data team. Mm -hmm. I didn't mention him earlier, but he's also the 
the science director, I think, at MUFON, uh, or some such title. But, um, uh, yes, I mean, that case demonstrates that there was an anomaly, uh, which maybe have gone underwater at one point. Uh, if you can, you know, believe the video evidence. Yeah. Um, and um, so, you know, it's, it's a very interesting, unique case. And, and it's, you know, again, the it's a good example of why you need a station like UFO Data because that case uh, is a solid case, meaning it demonstrates there was an unknown there. Uh, but we don't have a full... Um, range of data on the case naturally yeah what we have is you know just, just the, the limited type of instruments that were available uh, radar and the uh um and the camera system which was an infrared camera system as you said mm -hmm. um that's it no, no magnetic field no radio frequency you know though i don't think the pilot's communications were interfered with but that doesn't mean too much mm -hmm. you know no microwave, no, I mean, you know, nothing, of course, nothing else but that. I mean, we do know the temperature and all that. But um, so, um, again, that, that just underscores the fact that, um, and, and no no uh, knock at all at the, at the team that did this because they, they did a great job. But typically, on, on this is what you get on a standard UFO case, even when you do a fantastic investigation because you, you are relying on serendipity on, on, you know, what happened to be available, you can, you can learn, you, you can demonstrate that something unusual happened that was unexplained, and you can find a few characteristics about it, but you never get enough information to go to the next stage of inquiry. And, uh, and that's, you know, so then that's where the UFO phenomena has left us all these years. Uh, you know, we, whether it's a witness report, even from, you know, we have fantastic witness reports, for example, that are, that while they're not instruments, will give you all kinds of great data, you know, about the way the UFO appeared and looked and even sounded and so forth. Um, or you can have the, uh, the, this case in Puerto Rico, um, and they are very meaningful and uh, all of that. Uh, but, uh, you know, the UFO data project uh, was uh, initiated because we know. You know, as I've said several times, we've got to get more information. We need more data on these reports. Yeah, you got to have heavy science, because even that case, uh, as strong as it seemed, um, a fair amount of skeptics ripped it apart. Uh, some some of the explanations were laughable, but but we don't know what it is. I mean, it, you, you can't tell what it is. You can kind of... You can rule out what it probably isn't, but uh, you know when you when you put a lot of that stuff together and you have somebody who can sit down and take a look at the good data, you know, get out all the chaff and look at the good data. I think um, we probably are getting a better idea of the phenomenon we're working with. I would say yes. Yes, I, I mean. Uh, um... Yeah, I, I like you. We, we talked about earlier. Uh, we we aren't uh, you know ignorant about the UFO phenomena. We we have certainly learned some things about it. You know, if we take the best cases, the radar cases, we could talk about you know the the coin helicopter case in Ohio. Um, you know, we can say in the best cases, you know, this is what the UFO characteristics are, and this is the effect on the environment, and so forth. Um, and in fact, based on that, a guy named James McCampbell years ago in the 70s, um, you know, came up with, he wrote a book actually about uh, physical evidence cases and, 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 and based on uh, what happened in those cases and what was reported to happen mostly to our own equipment. Uh, he said, okay, so if these things happen, this might be what's causing them. It, it, you know, not so much, oh, it's an alien spacecraft. It's more like, well, if, if this is a headlights on a car go out, you know, here's what could make them go out uh, in this way, and therefore the UFO might be emitting this type of radiation. Uh -huh. um, so, yeah, you, you can work backwards that way um, and can use, as, as, as McCampbell did, um, our own uh, various types of terrestrial uh, equipment um, or appliances, you know, uh, you know, it was a refrigerator or something, you know, whatever it is, you know, if it's affected by a UFO, 
then you can say, well, okay, uh, if we, you know, it was affected and, and this uh, such and such, then you know what what might be happening. You know, the cars are reported actually in the old days to self-start. You know, UFO would would come nearby, the car would stop working, person would get out of the car and watch, and then the UFO would leave and their car would turn itself back on. Mm-hmm. Uh, and those those cases definitely have occurred, meaning that there are reliable witnesses who have said that happened, um, and they have not happened uh, recently. And, you know, the whole starting system of cars has changed over the years. And so um, so what that tells me, actually, is simply that, uh, I mean, that there's a big clue, by the way, mm-hmm. um, about, uh, right, what, again, what kind of radiation in, 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 in and what, what characteristics it has that UFOs are emitting that would have affected the uh, starters of cars and the electronics of cars years ago, right, and not be affecting it now. Yeah, yeah. Well, at least this type of physicality uh, tells us that it's not just somebody having a hallucination. You could, I mean, it's been said that there could be three or four people having a mass hallucination, but okay. But if that also includes... uh, a physical influence on a mechanical body, then it isn't a mental hallucination, then it's something else. So that does at least inform us that there is, at times, associated with this phenomenon, a, an actual physicality. So that we get to toss into the uh, puzzle pieces and, and put into place, too. It's all trying to put this puzzle together, really. Uh, right, right, right. I mean, yes, yeah, so the... the the the, uh, the fact that UFOs interact with the environment and, of course, unfortunately, sometimes even cause injuries to people, that's been reported over the mm-hmm. years, um, you know, means that there's something substantial about them. Uh, for example, skeptics uh, might want to say that, uh, or debunkers really, right, that there's nothing to UFOs except misperceptions, hoaxes, hallucinations, you know, et cetera. Right. And, you know, if, and if that's the case, then, you know, what about all these effects on equipment? Uh, what about these effects even on people, um, you know, et cetera? And of course, they have what they claim are, are explanations for that. But, uh, you know, I think we can agree that they're weak. Um, and so, yes, UFOs interact with, our, with the environment. Um, you, know, you know, a simple statement like that is true. Mm-hmm. And so... They leave traces in the environment. That's another way to put it. Um, and so, you know, we think with that, uh, you know, it's possible to uh, to measure those things directly rather than, you know, indirectly through their effect on an equipment or a person or, you know, what have you. Yeah. yeah, I would say that so far the needle has been moved away from those who would say that this is all in someone's mind and there's absolutely nothing to it. I'm That position, I believe, to a thinking, reasoning person, that position now is untenable. And what is more accurate is that there is some ongoing phenomenon, but we do not know what it is. We only understand some of its characteristics and behaviors. And that is the area where you would think that science would go, wow, let's take a look at this, you know. Um, But that part of it is not that part of the needle has not moved. I know Leslie Kane's book has has been a big influence there, and hopefully things are slowly moving towards science, understanding that there is something there that probably behooves them searching and looking into. And it's, it's a sad thing, and I was talking to Dr. Wendt, it's a sad thing that it takes, you know, um, citizen scientists in an ad hoc manner to try to cobble together some known technology to get a handle on this animal. It's just a sad state of affairs when it comes to science and their incapability of looking at this for some unknown reason. Well, there are, there are a variety of social and uh, structural and um, even psychological reasons um, and organizational, as I said, within the scientific field and how it's organized. So there are many factors that go into sciences um, basically ignoring uh, of the UFO phenomena today, particularly today, 
uh, but it's, I mean, these have always been operated. But they, uh, they, you know, today we know that uh, science pretty much completely shuns the phenomena. There was a, a a brief period several years ago when there were was a little more interest among scientists, but there's basically none now uh, among mainstream science. But it's complicated, uh, and uh, it's not likely to change anytime soon, though, because the, the, it's not just one thing that's causing uh, them to reject the phenomena. But, uh, you know, we, we're, we're not going to let that depress us. The one last thing here that I need to nail down is you do not have a deployment date yet for this process, for this project. You're still pulling components together. Yes, yes. So we, we, we don't have a prototype uh, constructed yet, or, or uh, let alone a deployment. So we are still in the you know, relatively early stages, yes. And there is no timeline yet. Right, right. We don't want to pin ourselves down to a timeline. I, it wouldn't be fair to, uh, to our supporters or us to give them a date because it's all volunteer, uh, as, as everything is in, in, in UFOs. And so... Uh, we're doing it when we can, and, and of course we all have other responsibilities. So um, yes, no timeline, but we're, but on the other hand, we're trying to get it done as soon as possible. Yeah. All right. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thanks, Martha. That was Dr. Mark Rodiger, President and Scientific Director of the J. Allen Hynek Center for UFO Studies and the Science Director for the UFO Data Project. This project is an attempt to focus on collecting objective physical evidence rather than subjective eyewitness accounts. It is a privately funded effort. But unlike many scientific endeavors, it is not crippled by the UFO taboo famously coined by another UFO Data Project member, Professor Alexander Wendt, and his colleague, Dr. Raymond Duvall, in their published work, Sovereignty and the UFO. Credible UFO reports often directly contradict what science thinks it knows. The UFO Data Project hopes to drop into the lap of mainstream science clear, unambiguous data gathered using the scientific method data that will dissolve the UFO taboo and energize serious investigation into this phenomenon by scientists and researchers. That brings to a close this episode 7 of API Conversations with Dr. Mark Rodiger. I've been your host, Marcia Barnhart. API Conversations is a spin-off of API Case Files. This podcast is a production of Aerial Phenomenon Investigations. The spoken content of API Conversations is distributed under the Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 4.0 license, as is the music heard during this program by DJ Spooky. Links to the information on this episode of API Conversations are included in the show notes. Be sure to check out our other API conversations as well as API case files at www.apicasefiles.com.